Namaste. So we are with Shurabindo's life, not with the surface life, as he himself said that my life has not been on the surface for men to see. And it is so significant uh, thing because all the time we are looking at surface events, surface circumstances, surface situations in everybody. Now, in general, yes, when men live on the surface, the life is on the surface. They themselves don't know what is going on deep within them. But for anyone who has risen above the ordinary human nature, this is your those words, anybody, the life is never on the surface because it's it, there is a whole world which is within. So that's why as I said uh, several times that when Shri Krishna kills, it is not, you know, <laughs> killing, it is called liberation. Because what is behind that act of killing is deep compassion. When Krishna kills, behind that killing, this is the compassion that this soul is struggling inside this body. Let it be freed. Which is a different act than when one kills out of anger, wrath, jealousy. So act is the same. But what makes the difference is the state of consciousness within. So we are trying to see that, you know, how was Shubhindu feeling that air of England? He has himself said that England was not a country he identified with. He always felt closer to France, a country which he never visited in this life. But he was in England and one wonders why would he go to England because he is not somebody whose destiny is decided by X, Y, Z. <laughs> but um, it is a conscious birth. Like mother said, she was born in France because the intellect of France was subtle, uh, you see years, in fact almost centuries, few centuries of uh, training and it could receive that light without breaking down. So Shurabindo's visit to England and how he visits England, he carries the bringer of light, takes the burden of darkness that he, before going to England, he experienced the invade, invasion of great darkness, tamas. And it stayed throughout England and when he comes back, then it left him. When he came back to Mother India, that's his humility. It's the light that had fully come up and the tamas had to be dissipated. So, while he was in England, one reason that I feel that he, he went to England is like in olden times we see in one of the stories that how a god visits the Asura's uh, den because he wants to know what is the best way to defeat him? Now, this not to say that England is Asura and somebody know, but at a point of time in history, there were these Asuric forces and for him, one of the mission that he had come up with was to overthrow the British powers. And so he must understand how they operate. That's why when later on Shubindo writes a scathing view of British justice, so he says British justice system is very interesting. Whether they do justice or not is not the point. But they want to make sure that it shows up as if justice has been done. See, so we have inherited that system. So that's why justice takes so long. You have witnesses after witnesses after witnesses. Why? Because you must show that I have examined 600 witnesses and then come to a decision. Whatever be your views, there are good judges, bad judges, all kind of people. But more than justice being done, it must present to the world a facade that justice has been is being done. Whether it's done or not is a different issue. And we all know that, you know, uh, how frail and fragile and imperfect the system is. But this is the kind of mentality. And second, he says when he describes the British character and temperament, that essentially a very good sense of business. And you see how... Um, now this is what is happening in the world and the world should take a lesson uh, whether they take a lesson or not but see how the British conquered India they didn't come fighting with arms that was much later they came to establish businesses the East India Company came if you ask today a typical Britain do you feel uh, bad about your country occupying you'll say no because I, we never did it it was the East India Company so they established a business. <laughs> they bought the kings <laughs> who were buyable or saleable products. And why they bought? Because of the typical bourgeois mentality. 
the samurai was lost so kings were happy that okay you run the administration and you give us the money so okay fine so they were very happy now when you control the administration and start running the king becomes nothing but a you know uh, just head for the name sake he could continue the maharaja could continue with his ways of life he could continue with his uh, you know wealth and everything whereas the common person was under the control of the um, east india company which was completely backed by the british and then uh, whenever they needed arms because there is a free trade access routes so this is how they captured it was a tremendous kind of um, uh, business war of a different kind which eventually led to a domination of a country which once uh, ruled from all the way from hindu kush now the panjshir is there the last bastion right up to the you know southern tip of burma that was india in at some point of time and so easily it could be uh, controlled why because there were people who had greed for money and um, they exercised authority and the common man just kept sleeping so he understood by going there what exactly how exactly the mind of a brit works so that when he comes he could use it and that's why when shubhendu wrote uh, several articles very very um, fiery articles yet he was very careful or spontaneously divinely careful if i may say so that despite the attempts to charge him in seditious cases thrice they made an attempt but all the th three times he was acquitted because he knew where the loophole is so perfectly so though they are very fiery articles they <laughs> just couldn't actually convict him so this is what he went and he understood the way of the english people otherwise in general it was a very cold uh, wintry nights he must have spent without proper overcoat without proper heating arrangement Uh, so what was he experiencing in life at that point of time now shubhendu in one of his the places says i am much more of a poet and a politician than a philosopher so we can see that during that time in england the poet and the politician blossoming but they are blossoming in the background of love as he describes sri krishna the master of man and his infinite lover so he is like a he experiences that blush of love now everybody in adolescence experience a blush of love but look what the method shubhendu uses is something amazing and i believe it also shows us a way because he has walked the way so it is not that we have a tendency like shubhendu says in one of the places people have a tendency to paint the parents of um, you know great men as being themselves great but he says that there was nothing of that sort in my parents and that is a credit because if you have borrowed a good heredity then well <laughs> born to a raja and you are a prince but he didn't bring that of course certain things get inherited little bit uh, physical constitution certain things like maybe the generosity of the father but otherwise he brought with him his own nature's challenges and he says that these challenges were much more than what any of you can imagine 10 times more shubhendu says that uh, the difficulties that human beings experience i have experienced all of them and 10 times more because uh, he has to show the way so if so there is a tendency to show that everything is very beautiful often even say in krishna's life okay it's fantastic stories and we love krishna but just imagine krishna is flawless krishna is always smiling krishna is always you know wonderful and it's so nice to you know know that he is with you by your side but how to be one with krishna of course you can follow the path of bhakti but uh now when we look at the life of krishna closely we realize that we are missing something very critically even in a great scripture and what we are missing is how krishna would have felt imagine a child being cast away from parents and then chased by all the demons <laughs> unimaginable he doesn't know there is no security to his life and all the time he is being chased plus he has to play the savior's role at some point of time and krishna is growing up with all that and growing up into his full adulthood where he can overthrow an empire what he must have felt when he experienced that uh, his own people are being governed by a king who is a most uh, notorious ruler basically a uh, almost a bandit 
because the kind of taxation that existed and these simple folks are, have no choice but to give. What he must have felt when he saw that the, the, the boys and girls around him, uh, they were lost in just ritualistic forms of worship. So all these experiences, now why? Because when a seer sees, he sees that way. But fortunately we have uh, Shurabindu himself describing as portions of his life and how exactly uh, he transmuted those which are, which we can call as human aspects in life. So one of his uh, earliest poems, you know, there is a series of poems written in England, um, Songs to Mirtila. So some people once asked, Mirtila, was it the name of a girl? So, you know, people don't take care even to check a little bit. Mirtil is a uh, flowering shrub. And uh, it's a very sacred shrub. So, and very interestingly, it's not a British, it, it is found in Britain also. But it's typically uh, found in the, found in Israel. And the Jews use it as a ceremony. So, it's even used as a sacred offering. So, when you, like we use the word, uh, we use Durva grass. Uh, so, same way we have um, metal in uh, ancient uh, Jewish uh, rituals and customs. Now, I don't know whether nowadays they use it or not. So, these are songs to Mithila which are being uh, um, given as an offering, sacred offering. They are flowers which are being offered to the sunshine above and receiving that touch. So, the very first poem contains a very interesting dialogue between uh, Glaucus and um, Athon. So, uh, Glaucus is again, um, uh, you know, something which is greyish kind of covering on um, shrubs, shrubs which are covered with a kind of grey um, colour. So it is, um, it is symbolic of night, night which is going to come. And Ithon is related to Athene, the light, the sun. So it reflects the day. So very first uh, dialogue is about night and day. So we can put it in our words, night and day speaking to each other. And each describing its glory. Now when you look at it like this, the poem becomes so beautiful. So Glaucus, the grey, says, Sweet is the night, sweet and cool, as to parched lips a running pool. Whole day one has laboured. So one looks forward to night. Oh, it is so sweet. As... To parched lips a running pool, sweet when the flowers have fallen asleep and only moonlit rivulets creep. These must be the images that he has seen, but how living and awake. And when we see that later on when Sri describes in Savitri in the very first canto, where he says that, you know, air was singing a hymn and it was raising uh, like a yagna to heavens. Uh, air was a link between earth and heaven. Then one understands that uh, how sensitive that nature must be, which saw in images of uh, nature, material nature, the presence of something divine. So we just speak of night and day, how the divine felt the night and the day. Like glow worms in the dim and whispering wood to commune with the quiet heart and solitude. So gifts of night are that, you know, you are done with the whole day and you can sit quietly and reflect in solitude uh, unfortunately snatched away nowadays <laughs> in our life when earth is full of whispers when no daily voice is heard of men so when earth is full of whispers if we can tune into the silence but higher audience brings the footsteps of invisible things is this not a yogi's uh, experience of life he is hearing footsteps of invisible things. Gods, angels, who knows, fairies. Later on he speaks of all these things, dryad, tired. He speaks of them even in these poems, which are all, you know, Greek fairies. And he was experiencing them, footsteps of in invisible things. So he is not speaking of inaudible, but invisible. You can't see them, but you experience their steps. When o'er the glimmering treetops bowed, the night is leaning on a luminous cloud. Look at the image. And always a melodious breeze sings secret in the weird and charmed trees. As if they are charmed by some presence and 
He is experiencing the presence, the spirits of the tree. Mother says that there are, uh, there is a spirit in the tree, there is a spirit in the wat in water uh, bodies, there are spirits in uh, fire, in all the elemental forces. So he is experiencing them. Pleasant it is then heart over heart to lie alone with that clear moonlight and that listening sky. We miss that now. <laughs> it is so pleasant and it's an indication to all of us to reconnect. That's a time when we can reconnect. Why? Because all the noises have gone away. So what do we do? Just lie in the moonlight and that listening sky. That sky that listens. How beautiful this is. This is the very first passage from the very first poem. So you can imagine that what beauty and perfection already in his heart. Ithon. So, but there is, must, they also must have its own beauty. So she says, but day is sweeter. Morning bright has put the stars out at the light and from the dewy cushions rise. Now we all experience dew drops sometimes. We have forgotten to see all this. Now he speaks of them as cushions. They have come from heaven. So they are like little bounty of grace which is cushioning the heart of earth. Sweet flowers half opening their eyes. Flowers are living, they are conscious, they have a soul. Oh, pleasant then to feel as if newborn, the sweet, unripe and virgin air, the air of morn. Because it's not yet been polluted by human contact. Night has cleared the air. And these are occult truths, how the mother speaks of the samadhi. She says, you know, when people have gone, from 11 to whatever time they now close. So when people have gone, the gods come and they clean the air. So what do they clean the air of? Formations. A lot of people come and they throw their desires also. So because it's their taposthili, these gods come, beings come, whose work is to just clean the air of these formations. Which in ordinary places where people go and offer their, you know, desires, or seek desires. This system doesn't exist. This is an occult system. And then so beautiful. Um, and pleasant are her melodies. Rustle of winds. Rustle of trees. Birds voices in the eaves. Birds voices in the green melodious leaves. The herdsman's flute among his flocks. Who was the herdsman with the flute in England? I just want to ask somebody this question. <laughs> what image? To an Indian, this image reminds at once of Krishna. Herdsman flute. Among his flocks, sweet water hurrying from reluctant rocks. The rocks, the resistances which are not ready to yield. Suddenly you see as if they have yielded and waters are running through. And all sweet arts and all sweet charts and all sweet sounds that please the noonday flowers, morning has pleasure. Noon has golden peace. And afternoon repose and eve the hearts increase. How beautifully he describes it. We spend a whole day in, I have to meet this person, that person, this assignment. We miss God. So many ways he comes speaking through the flowers, through the leaves, through the night, through the day, through the moon, through the glittering of stars, through the glow worms, through the hearts man. And we miss. And this continues. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll just read the last bit. It's by Ethan. Because uh, Glaucus says, Night, love's feet were on the sea when he dawned on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> what does it mean on the sea? Turbulent, rocky, it will just, you know, vanish with the morning. So, love's feet were on the sea. See, look at how many images are simultaneously within it. His wings were purple grained and slow. His voice was very sweet and very low. His rose-lit cheeks, his eyes pale bloom, were sorrow's anteroom. 
His wings did cause melodious moan. His mouth was like a rose overblown. The cypress garland of renown did make his shadowy crown. So Ithon says, Not from the mighty sea love visited me. So this is the different experience of love during day and night. I found as in a jewel box love rose red sleeping with imprisoned locks and I have ever known him wild and merry as a child. Now why? Because in daytime love blooms all around. Whereas at night love becomes you know confined, restrained. Then there is the moon. The moon is there as the only symbol of love. Isn't it? That's why romantic poets speak of moon. As if in the night there is no other image that can make you feel love. But in the daytime you have flowers, you have birds. Everything is rushing and speaking of love. And I have ever known him wild and merry as a child. As roses red, as roses sweet. The west wind in his feet. Tulip girdled. So the mala. <laughs> garland of tulips in the girdle. Tulip girdle kind. And bold. That is love when it is daytime. There is in it a courage and a benevolence. If you want to take these two qualities to its utmost, kindness turns into benevolence and uh, boldness into courage. With heart sees in his curls of gold, since in the silver mist, bright Simothia's lips I kissed. So, we, when we experience these states, states of romance, one of the best ways is to release them through poetry. Sri says that between them, art, music and poetry are a perfect education for the soul. And he speaks about now, psychologists also speak about that. What do we do? Many people ask, what do we do with these impulses that are within us? Yes, they are there. Some people just, you know, close their eyes or they become very uh, hard because they can't face these forces. One of the best ways is to sublimate them through poetry and art and music. What about anger through sports? It is actually known in modern psychology as sublimation. So sublimation is the same thing which takes a very uh, rather, you know, uh, crude form. You make it very refined. Now here, love has been uplifted to night, day, material nature. Everywhere you see love. One of the first um, first writing of Shurabindo which is published I think it was again around the age of 17-18 the sole motive of man's existence you know it's an incomplete writing but very interestingly there are there is a dialogue going on somebody speaks of this some, some, somebody and eventually they come on the subject of love and when they speak of love uh, someone says that you know love is all meaningless and you know it makes people stray, all this. And then the other person says, and they built um, the monument of marriage on its corpse. Can you just imagine anything? <laughs> and they built the monument of marriage on its corpse. But then, there is a lady, girl sitting silent all through that entire dialogue going on. And they ask her, what do you feel? Now obviously, somebody sitting silent, she has to reveal the voice of the soul, represent that. What do you feel? Would you say something about love? Then she says, love, but it is the whole meaning of the universe. And you read it, it like completely, there are different ways. She says that is the sole motive of purpose of existence. So how he has taken up all these feelings and lifted them, them up in an offering and universalized them in the entire nature. And then, very interestingly, people often say that he remained uh, unconnected from England. If you read the outer life, you will see that, um, you know, except for his father sending him some newspaper cuttings, he remained alien to his country. Well, you know, Shubhinder writes a poem in England on quail. Quail is an Asian bird found primarily in China and India. And of course, a little bit of uh, probably Philippines, I'm not sure. But quail is an Asian bird. And this is a poem dedicated to quail. And who is quail? Quail announces in India the coming of spring. So he writes a poem, O quail, quail. 
it's typical Indian poem. There are several places there is a reference to very typically Indian images. O quail, honeyed envoy of the spring. So she's not a bird anymore. She has come announcing that spring is going to come. Seize thy too happy voice. Grief's record. Seize. You are too happy and thrilled. Just stay a little quiet. <laughs> For I recall that day of vernal trees. The soft Asoka's bloom. See Asoka. The laden winds and green felicity of leaves. The hush, the sense of nature living in the woods. But sweetest to my pleased and singing heart. Thy voice, O quail, in the people tree. Sitting on the people tree, the quail says that nothing like it. I have lived in the woods amongst all this, but nothing like that voice. Just imagine, he has carried an image from India. Seven-year-old boy. What did he carry with him? He carried the voice of the quail. It's a representative bird of the Indian setting. And all of us who have grown up in villages know, you know, what it is to hear a quail's voice. <laughs> Mangoes arrive and things like that. So he has carried that and he says, I miss you. Can you ever imagine who could miss a quail? I miss you. Why? Because you are the symbol of the land from where I have come. O oh, me, for pleasure turn to bitterest tears. O oh, me, for the swift joy too great to live. That only bloomed one hour, O oh, wondrous day, that the crown the bliss of those delicious years. So he says that it was such a short time that I, you know, enjoyed you. When he's missing, so normally when we miss, what do we do? We pick up the phone, speak to relatives. But he is thinking of that wonderful, the whole land, and he is bringing out that voice of that uh, land and. O tireless voice of spring, again I lie in odorous gloom of trees, unseen and near. The wind lark guggles in the golden leaves, the woodworm spins in shrillness on the bough. How can I like this <laughs> bird? She's too shrill. I want to hear your voice. Just imagine. So he says that wind lark guggles in the golden leaves, so that's like a guggle. And the woodworm spins in shrillness on the bough. But I miss you. That's how he describes. The dawn brings sweetest recompense of tears. And she thou lovest hears thy pain. Why? Because quail's voice is to call the mate. So you see always you will say. And quails respond to no, the quail voices. If you take out the voice, he will instantly respond. Because she is searching for the mate. So invariably by her voice the mate hears. So that's the symbol of spring. So now he is taking that image and showing what his heart must have felt as a lonely child. As a stranger amidst this world. It's not a loneliness of a human kind. But as somebody who is experiencing world like this, can you imagine what he must have felt with all the people around him? So that lonely child... Despite all friends and, you know, his brothers and people around, what he must have experienced, he describes so beautifully. And she, thou lovest, hears thy pain. It comes when you call. <laughs> but I am desolate in the heart of fruitful months. I am widowed in the sight of happy things. Why widowed? Because I once had the sight of happy things. So I'm widowed. He's longing to see. What a way to describe that I have a longing now to see. Uttering my moan to the unhoused winds. Oh, quail, quail to the winds and thee. So I'm uttering the moan that they may reach somewhere that I long to see you. And the quail <laughs> along with it. So there, there are plenty of such poems which you know we'll read. But it shows how the lover within him and the poet within him is blossoming and right in the very start we see there's somebody who could be as vast as 
bringing love in that entire material nature and everyday experience of life night and day the bird the flowers is universalized love people speak about you know the early brush of poetry and from the poetic point of view now obviously i don't think anybody in this world this is my own feeling is competent to speak of shirbindo's poetry so i am i will never dare to do that i have my own understanding of poetry but leave it aside just enjoy the sense of it all and the sound of it just see the sound how it runs so beautifully and the sense of it where every little image becomes a sight to adore to love to feel to sense to express his feelings and to leave such beautiful <laughs> messages for the world but along with that he speaks of um two things he said i am a poet and a politician first so we see these two things coming up in shurbindo um in his stay in england so how did the politician come up in him now shurbindo uh, identified you know he had come to free the world not just india india's freedom was meant as a path to free the world that's what he says that india's freedom and nationalism is so that the world can be freed of slavery to ignorance that's why freedom is needed because a country which is not politically free cannot be really attempt true spiritual freedom in the real sense of the word so political freedom was a step towards spiritual freedom and in his poem invitation he writes very beautifully i am the spirit of freedom and pride so what was going on in england at that point of time shobindo has gone in 1879 1870 the irish revolution had started and we all know the its origins was you know um the catholics and the protestants so it was like um, very few people know i mean perhaps they know that england is one country but uh, when you speak about britain britain is three little units scotland welsh and england and you speak of united kingdom that then it includes these three plus northern ireland but initially all these countries were under subjugation all these parts and the same policy people dying people were being killed these are historical facts protesters were killed like anything to suppress but eventually what came out of that irish revolution should be the greatly appreciated that fiery spirit of victory fiery spirit of love for the country which all this he had imbibed and eventually as of now uh, you will see the whole map like you know most people are aware of the great britain but you will see that um, there is the northern ireland which though is kind of autonomous but it has chosen to go with great britain but when you uh, with the united kingdom uh with the um, yes united kingdom so but the beautiful part is that if in olympic for instance if the uh, if you see the tally of great britain so northern ireland is not included because it's it's not a part of it's a very complex structure but what the britishers did was exactly what they did in india they divided northern ireland and the southern ireland which became Irish Republic so you see IRA is a completely separate entity and they had joined European Union now they are a separate country because of the Brexit so it's a uh, very interesting politics at that point of time where the spirit the Irish spirit and if you really look closely into the Irish spirit and the Irish way of life you feel a close relationship with India in many ways um, for example we'll hear about the druids those who are aware of asterix comics uh, those who you know druids were those who were old time alchemists so they would make those magic herbs potions mix it and give it so um, druids are basically part of the irish culture though many of them now what is called as the irish republic is mainly catholics and the other part largely protestants they went with um, you know uh, england so here is um, two three poems based on this uh, experience and one of them is very interesting the lost deliverer now we don't know about whom he is speaking because there is no very mention of that but what is interesting is he is using greek images and it starts with a greek image just see the image pythian he came 
repressed beneath his heel the hydra of the world with bruised head you know the image of kaliya daman in india the hydra of the world bruised below his heels and who is this pythian so pythian comes from greek roots again so uh, python that great snake so it was ultimately there was this um, this snake who tried to you know fight with apollo just like vritrasura and indra but the twist in the story is eventually the python or the pythia they became um, subdued by apollo and they became giving prophecies so in greek we hear about the oracles of delphi in savitri there are references of tripod seat so this uh, uh, priestess would sit who would on a particular day get possessed by this spirit of pythia who was subjugated by apollo Uh, so in the temple of apollo and he'll see the future and uh, its um, predictions were pretty accurate so it that famous story which we have often heard that socrates who is the wisest man in the land and the oracle said socrates and so when socrates comes he says is it really true how can it be because i know nothing so he goes around the verb you know whatever greek world is there and say now i understand why the goddess uh, delphi oracle of delphi uh, is pythia so uh, why she said that i am the wisest man so people asked him that why he said because see i went and asked people lot of questions but nobody really seems to know but they have the illusion of knowledge i don't have that illusion i know that i do not know so i am the wisest man so this uh, delphi cult has gone away because in some 300 ad or something this um, uh, delphi that priestess predicted that now all is ended things are gone and within 15 years the whole things changed rome came in roman armies and you know the entire uh, everything changed so this cult while it was being practiced was very very um, uh, true in many respects but it's gone so he says that the lost the river pythian he came repressed beneath his heel the hydra of the world with bruised head this could be related to perseus because the image is of perseus who kills medusa and that demon and holds his head in his hand and carries it to the goddess athene so and he is the one who actually uh, eventually goes to the temple of delphi so most likely it is about perseus whom we see several references to that vainly since fate's immeasurable wheel could parley with the straw eventually he changed yeah, when we talk about shivendra's place then we'll speak about how what is the real significance of the story of perseus the deliverer so though he could do it and yet in vain a weakling sped the bullet went to customs usual night we fell because a woman's faith was light now who that woman is what that story is we really don't know or is it really symbolic of nature we really don't know but there is the reference to a greek legend in very early poem of shivendra several references in several poems another one uh, again an irish uh, person charles stuart panel 1891 uh, he is uh, one of the revolutionaries who um, played an active role and uh, um, he is regarded as the spirit of the irish revolution at one point of time but people found out about him that he had in that time it was uh, having an illicit affair with another lady was like you are condemned so he was eventually unfortunately condemned by his own people and died a death which was incognito though he is he was regarded as the man who changed the entire you know revolutionary process charles stuart panel o oh, pale and guiding light now star unsphered so like a lonely star deliverer lately hailed now you see when he speaks of still he is a star but lonely because nobody everybody abandoned him so shubhendra at one place says that great men have great vices and he speaks of that that when there is an abundance of energy he is like a vibhuti it can take he describes vices as abundance abundant energy flowing into wrong channels because there is so much of it 
So something like that must have happened. So he says that deliverer, deliverer lately hailed. After he has gone away, people still speak that he was the man who really changed the whole course. Since by our lords most feared, most hated, hated because feared. So people were, you know, what is scathing thing on human nature? When people hate you, know that they are very afraid of you. Somebody who hates you is... <laughs> Isn't it true? One of the reasons why they hate you, because they are very afraid that this fellow is a claimant to the throne or something like, you know, so hated because feared. Who smotes them with an edge surpassing swords? Is it? Master strategist, statesman of very great caliber. So if you read about his political uh, you know, ways, actions, very amazing. He enacted new laws, lot of changes he brought, which is really amazing. Thou too wert then a child of tragic earth, since vainly fill thy luminous doom of birth. So birth, luminous, but filled with doom. As often happens to children from heaven born on earth. And the last one which I have on my list today is um, um, Hick Jacket. Many people just miss this poem. What is this? What does it mean? Uh, Hick Jacket. So it's about uh, Shubindo's, he is not mentioned but probably visited a cemetery. Now it's again a place in um, it's an Irish cemetery where he must have gone and seen these Irish revolutionaries who died and their graves are there. Now, of course, um, it's, you know, many things would be there. But Hick Jacket, Glass Nevin Cemetery. So, Shubindo must have visited and experienced. Like we have those Amar Jyoti, Jawan, etc. You know, when you go, so what he must have experienced there, seeing these patriots lying below in the graves. Patriots, behold your garden. Garden is, you know, the reward. What is the reward of a patriot? Dying for the country. See, it starts at a high note. Patriots, behold your garden. This man found Erin. Erin is um, the mother of Ireland, you may say. It's another. From Erin, actually, Ireland comes. This man found Erin, his mother, breeding, chastised, bound. Now just transfer this image to Sri Bhavani Bharati, where he says, how can I sleep when I see my mother with demons sucking her blood? This is an image which is exactly there. Erin, his mother, bleeding, chastised, bound. So whose mother is she? Patriots. So this patriot got a reward. And what did he see? He saw his mother, Erin. Bleeding, chastised, bound, naked to imputation, poor, denied. This was the state. While alien masters held her house of pride. You feel the patriotism in this poem. And then comes the image of Durga. Amazing. But this image is of the Greek goddess Pallas Athene. And Athene is actually Durga. But seen a Greek once, one place he says that, you know, if you are there in, in a different context, you will see the same goddess, but you will call her with a different name. Because you are used to that. So the moment, uh, like we do that, you know, now when we see the image, we will remember Durga. But have you, think of Athene's image, the warrior with um, the head of the demon in her hand. It's actually that image. Sword in her one hand and the the demon's head in another hand. This is what Perseus had, uh, you know, when he had killed that goddess, not goddess, the snake uh, woman. If you looked into her eyes, you would be charmed into stone. So he had to kill her and bring her head. And her head had all hairs were like serpents. So it's a mythical creature. So we can imagine, you know, what it means to have serpents in the head. <laughs> All hostile thoughts, feelings, and but it, but she carried a charm. She could hypnotize, and Perseus had to go there. I think there was a movie also like that, and Perseus is to go there and 
get her head and then give it back and Ethne is the goddess who is helping Perseus he is a vibhuti of Ethne so here he describes and now behold her whom? Erin island mother of island and now behold her terrible and fair with the eternal ivy in her hair armed with the clamorous thunder how she stands like palace self palace is the ethnic goddess like palace self the gorgon in her hands she is holding the head of the demon in her hands look at her just read these lines and you know feel the image of Durga for us and see it also brings that mystic experience has been the same it's just that names have changed and now behold her Terrible and fair with the eternal ivy in her hair, armed with the clamorous thunder, how she stands like palace self, the gorgon, gorgon in her hands. But then, even when the gods come, they fight the demon. For a moment, life is fine, it surfaces again. So he says, True that a puza will be easily passed. The vision ended, she herself is cast, her fate behind her, yet the work not vain. So when a patriot dies for the country, and because he has seen the country as his mother, and he sees the mother bleeding, and that the same mother wakes up the Durga inside him. That's the vision here. That he sees his mother bleeding, naked, imputed. You know, like Swami Vivekananda's people speak about that when he was in the Himalayas and he suddenly saw Bharat Mata in chains and he was deeply moved and he prayed and suddenly sees Bharat Mata change into the, the golden mother. And she says, why are you weeping? These are chains I can do away at once. I am the one who has allowed these chains to be there. Then if he is reassured, it is the same vision but in a much more different, in a different setting but with a much vaster implication. So on one side he sees Ireland, mother, you know, uh, imputed, which is chained, naked, uh, bleeding. But then this patriot who has seen his mother like that, suddenly he sees his vision change. And he sees instead the image of palace Athene with the sword and the gorgon. And he fights and he dies. That's why it is the grave. So he says, but is the work vain? Because Shurabindu came before the uh, partition of Ireland and all this took place. That's late, I think 1920s or something. So while he was there, he saw the graves. And I am sure he must have put that fire inside. That revolution had just begun, begun uh, or it was reaching its high point around that period. True, her fate behind her, yet the work not vain, since that which once has been may be again prophetic. And she, this image yet recover, fired this image of the future that Ireland has shown. You see, Sister Nivedita was an Irish woman, so she could easily understand the, uh, the pain of the Indian people. Because she had associated that what we are under the British rule and what all was happening. So, and the rest we know our history. And she, this image yet recover, fired with godlike workings, brain and hands inspired. Now you see brain and hands inspired. Bande Matram, million, Koti Kantha, Koti Sheesh. So she will once again awaken and inspire million hands and brains. So stand the blush of battle on her cheek, voice made army potent. Her voice could bring fire into arms, army potent. Uh, what is that? Sahasra Bhuj Dharani. Trishank Kothi. Kantha Kalkal Ninad Karale and speaks about the uh, million armed mother. Now look here, it is exactly that vision, exactly that vision where he says, 
and she this image yet recover fired with god like workings brain and hands inspired so stand the blush of battle on her cheek voice made army potent deeds that loudly speak like some dread sphinx half patent to the eyes she'll wake up he knows half veiled in formidable secrecy so what is this uh, present image it says it is veiling a secrecy this is the real um, mother irish mother who is lying right now she will wake up i have glimpsed her the patriot has glimpsed her and one day she will come out and she will set a fire a million armies and once again step out now you see this is exactly what he does in india he had already known this that awaken the soul of a nation when he write durga stroth this is exactly what shurvinder is doing that let the mother awake and when she awakes rest she will handle so he says the time will come the blush of battle on her cheek voice made army potent deeds that loudly speak like some dread sphinx half patent to the eye so you don't know what sphinx is the mystery she has one face but she is also the double face so sphinx is regarded as um anything which is ambiguous it has a double face on the face of it it is death and behind it is eternal life it's up to you if you know the truth you pass through the sphinx gates of sphinx fearlessly she will open the doors to eternity and if you don't know if you think i am the body she will slay you and you die so sphinx is always the image of uh, two contrary aspects ambiguous eternal life and death together so he says that half hidden half patent to the eye half veiled in formidable secrecy and he who raised her from her forlorn life loosening the fountains of that mighty strife he, he who had raised this power from her sleep where sits he where is he gone Let's see it will end very beautifully Where is he? Nobody knows his name. On what high foreshadowing throne? Where does he sit? What reward in heaven has he got? Guarded by grateful hearts who are happy that here is a man who laid his life for the sake of his country and its pride. And then he says, "Where is he sitting? Where sits he on what high foreshadowing throne? Guarded by grateful hearts beneath this stone." You know, it reminds me of when mother speaks of the material envelope of a master. So Shurvindu is everywhere, but this is the material envelope, his throne, majestic throne. And when we go to the samadhi, it's his throne where we go. He sits there, still, supreme, sublime. Beneath this stone, he lies. This garden only. Ireland gave what he Ireland could give. He sits on his high throne, but it could give him only this. We must have seen the graves, not cared for, not even bothered. Nobody to offer a flower, a broken heart, and an unhonored grave. Such a touching. Looking at the grave of a patriot, what Sri Vinod was experiencing at who knows fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. is it normal is it ordinary is it that he began his yoga from 1904 <laughs> this is who can write experience life this like this but who is already a yogi i think we'll stop here this is the last poem which has been published which he wrote in england then there are poems he wrote in baroda some of them do refer to the british images and we'll read them as we go by and by but we can see the poet the patriot and the lover of man blossoming inside and the yogi who is experiencing the touch of the master in every little image in every little sound and the patriot who is missing the coel and the red asokas of his country namaste